on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. So I just faced like all of this rejection. I just was like, I'm not going to let these people make the decision for me and decide whether or not I'm going to be an author. I'm going to figure out a way to do it on my own. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Yes, in five days' time, Ads for Authors opens. A rare August opening, uh, Mark, but we decided to. We, we like to space out the launches and obviously make sure everyone has an opportunity. We only open for two to three weeks and a chance to onboard. So let's have a quick chat about Ads for Authors if people don't know what the course is, what it involves and whether it would be right for them. Who is Ads for Authors for Mark Dawson? Uh, well, it's for anyone who wants to use advertising to sell their books, pretty much, which is that should really include everyone these days because I think that, as I've said before, the days of free visibility on any platform really from Amazon um, to Facebook has, has is long gone now. You, you do have to pay to be involved. Um, and so that, that's, it's a pain, but it's also a blessing because um, uh, most authors wouldn't know um, what they were doing. So your window cleaner actually shadows on the wall behind you. Is your yeah. window cleaner cleans the windows. Has arrived. <laughs> has he got clothes? <laughs> Just, <laughs> it's, his, it's his young assistant. I don't know where he oh, is. Okay. Oh, that's, that's good. Oh, yeah. So it's a uh, it, it is an opportunity because most authors um, are not aware of how to advertise or or don't either don't do it, don't know how to do it properly. That does give you a chance to get your books in front of uh, their readers and also other people who'd be interested in in the stuff that you're writing. So yeah, it's I think it's a course for everyone really these days. Um, um, it, it is a necessity rather than a luxury. Yeah, um, and uh, I've been sort of the proof of that because not only have I written one book, which I actually turned a profit on in year one of about £900 over the year, um, I'm also running Fuse Books. And in fact, beginning of the month is the kind of the week where I tend to really focus on Fuse, get everything in order for the, for the month and redo the campaigns and make some tweaks here and there. So I've been, I've been nose into both Facebook ads and uh, starting to get Amazon ads going again uh, within Fuse. And yeah, you know, we've got authors who send me nice emails every month saying, thank you very much. So there is, um, you, you have to get it, you know, as I know from my cost as well, it's it's quick and easy to lose money advertising. Um, so you do, you do have to, there's no shortcut, unfortunately. You have to kind of learn the business and you need to learn through other people's mistakes. And for me, that was the most valuable thing of learning from you is that you've been there, made the mistakes, refined it and and although I deviate slightly from one or two other things that you teach, that's only based on the foundation of, of what you do, which I think is probably the right way to do the course. In fact, the mm -hmm. people I think have been most successful at the course have, have literally followed it step by step and only then have started to tweak things that might be to do with their subgenre or the way that they want to run the campaigns. But you need to learn the, learn the fundamentals. And the platforms yeah. change, right? So, you know, we're always uh, back into the course making changes. They do, yeah. I'm just going to go back on one thing you said. So you made £900 on your first book, which is very good. But what people listening might think, £900 for a year's work, that's not very impressive, which I suppose it isn't in terms of kind of just cash terms. But what you've done is you've built an audience for your second, third, whatever book following that. And it's actually, and you've also come out in the black, which is, that's, that is a definitely, a definitely a good result. Um, yeah. I didn't intend to make a profit. I intended no, no. to spend about £5,000 on advertising over the year and break even or make a small loss up. To, I think I gave myself about £1,500 that I would, I would ex lose. And that was an investment in exactly what you've talked about, mm -hmm. about building an audience. And I now have 740 or maybe more than that reviews on my first book. Um, and book two launched to a higher number of pre-orders. Reviews are coming in for that already. And it's possible... I'm going to be making a profit day to day now with book two, but it's too early for me to tell because I'm still in the launch period for that. Um, Don't you, be too, you can't be too successful because then no. we won't do the podcast anymore. So I have to, I have a word with Amazon, maybe just put the put my yeah. um, put a finger on the scale a little bit to um, depress things. <laughs> but but yeah, if you see if you see sales going down, it may not be a coincidence. No, thank you, you very much. much. 
Well, at some point, you might be asking me if I can mention a John Milton book in my newsletter. Yeah, it's possible. Maybe in five, ten years' time. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Okay. Uh, my biggest thing is writing, which is the number one thing we should be doing. It's been so colossally busy the last three weeks. I've, my feet have barely touched the ground. I'm sure yours haven't either. And um, uh, the first thing that drops away for me is, is that writing. I've done a little bit, but um, I'm hoping on holiday when I'm going to do far, far less. Not nothing. Cause I, and in our lives, we don't get to do nothing in our jobs, even on holiday unfortunately with SPF and Fuse but I'm going to do less and I'm hoping to do a little bit more writing which I enjoy so yeah although I think I said to you before so the short story I'm writing to give away to try and build my mailing list this year before I start novel three I've set it in our Royal Air Force 1950s and I think commercially that's the wrong place I'm now having second thoughts about that whether I should stop it and start something set in the states which I quite enjoy writing as well so anyway well, that's that's for me to ponder yeah, absolutely. See what you feel like when you're in America. It'll probably make it even easier for you. Yes, yeah. Do some research. Niff over to Edwards Air Force Base. Get shot at from the uh, security pilots. Yep. Anyway, okay, let's move on to our interview. We have Kyra Orwell. Kyra uh, is a very, very motivated, brilliantly successful uh, woman who has used her feeling that women should feel more empowered and should be more active to drive her own career and her own writing. And it seems so. We kind of take it for granted in 2022 that women, why wouldn't they feel empowered to do all the things that men have done in the past? But actually 20 years ago, even, it did feel different for women and it took um, uh, a few leaders in the space to to help and be an advocate for, for women and Cara was definitely one of them. So let's hear from Cara and then Mark and I will be back for a quick chat. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Cara Orwell, welcome to the Self Publishing Show. Lovely to have you here. We're going to talk about the difference between trad and indie, the advantages of indie, and I think about empowerment, particularly female empowerment, should we say? That seems to be yeah. like the, the theme we're going to go down. Okay. All right. Why don't we start with a bit about you? Can you introduce yourself to our, our listeners? Sure. Uh, my name is Cara. I'm from New York City. Lived here my whole life. So I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, I've been writing, I mean, God, ever since I was a little girl, I wrote my first book in the fourth grade. I put together like two pieces of like canvas glued together. It was called The Cat Who Couldn't Fit In. It was my dream to be an author from the time I was young. Um, and then my, you know, my career kind of progressed. I was in the music industry for a while, but I still always had that desire to write. Didn't really know what I would write about. And in my mid twenties, I had a blog that I knew I was going to turn into a book started to connect with women, just really telling my stories going through, I guess you could call it a quarter life crisis. I think that's what the kids say now. <laughs> so started okay. sharing my stories. <laughs> I didn't realize you were allowed a, a crisis at that stage as well. I mean, okay, fair enough. I think we have, I think we have constant crises, yes. right? Growing up. But yes. This yeah, was yeah. happened to be in my mid twenties. And I really just started to chronicle what I was going through. And I was still working a full-time job. I worked in advertising at MTV and I felt really unfulfilled. So the blog became this creative outlet for me. And as I started to share my stories, I started to get messages from women all around the world before Instagram, but there was Twitter. So that was how we were all kind of connecting in the social media sphere. This is like 2008. And I started to really feel like I wanted to develop a book, but I wanted to do even more than develop a book. I wanted to really help women, you know, as I was learning with everything that I was going through in my life, there was a breakup or just, you know, choosing my career and going on a different path. I wanted to be able to give real advice to women who were facing their own challenges. So I became a certified professional life coach and started writing and my books just took off and I think I was writing for about six out of the eight years I was at MTV. And then finally, I just took the plunge once I was making enough money. I always said if I could just make pay my rent from my books, which I did, all self-published. And I left and it's just kind of, you know, taken on a life of its own from there. I've got a podcast. I've now written nine books, um, self-published eight of those nine books. Um, I coach women entrepreneurs mainly just on mindset and how to kind of get through all the imposter syndrome we all feel and the insecurities and the self-doubt. And I'm actually writing a memoir now. So I've taken a complete turn from my personal development writing and I'm working on that. It's about love and relationships. So it's super exciting. Okay, well, we'll unpack some of that. It started with the blog. The blog, yep. so what was the desire? What did you feel you needed to say when you started the blog? So the blog was called The Champagne Diet. That's still the name of my brand. Um, it was a very tongue in cheek name for it. I was looking for something that I could drink that I could incorporate into like a healthier, if you will, lifestyle. Champagne's, you know, 90, 100 calories in a glass. 
And I started to, I came up in a conversation with a friend. I started drinking champagne and we joked around. And I called it the champagne diet. But I noticed as soon as I started to drink champagne, I felt like a little bit more elevated. You know, champagne's like usually like, especially here in the States, no one really drinks it. So it was like a fancy thing. And I kind of quickly became a metaphor for me on how I wanted to live my life. When we pop a bottle of champagne, we're usually celebrating something where, you know, kind of like, relishing in the moment. And I really wasn't living that way. So the blog was a way for me to quote, you know, document my quote, champagne life, if you will, even though it was not fancy, I was 26, 27, living in New York, you know, trying to make ends meet. Um, But I was really experiencing a lot of changes and it really was rooted in gratitude and celebration for everything that I had. And I started to document my stories, broke up with a really, you know, bad boyfriend for me, kind of started my writing career, progressed through MTV, kind of just became healthier mentally and physically. And that was really the impetus for writing the blog. And I felt like it, I wanted to appeal to women like me at the time who really wanted to work on personal development, but I didn't see anyone out there teaching it who looked like me. It was like a lot of the Tony Robbins of the world and everything felt just a little bit corporate you know, and at the time sex in the city was the big show. And I was like, there's gotta be somebody like a Carrie, but that doesn't want to just talk about men, but wants to talk about like chasing your dreams, you know, and pursuing the things that make you happy. So that was sort of what inspired the blog. And then the first book that I wound up doing. So did you think that the, the self-help stuff, I mean, there was Tony Robbins, but even before him, who was the guy who did the shaver, Carl, whatever his name was, I remember those, they were all men as well, weren't they? And I guess that has changed now, but maybe you're in, in, in the sort of vanguard of that. Totally. It was a very male dominated industry and it just felt very dry to me. Like there was nobody like my, I mean, my books are like littered, littered with curse words. You know, I make, I have like a sense of humor. Everything's very dry, like sarcastic. And I didn't see that. I felt like everything was really serious. I'm like, there's gotta be a way to bridge the gap and to make people laugh and to tell these stories about what I was really going through, but really weave in like actionable, actionable items for people and how they wanted to improve their lives based on what I was learning. And how did you get visibility for your blog? Um, Twitter and Facebook. I had a personal Facebook page that I would just, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. It was again, like I had just signed up for Facebook, I think in 2009, 2008. And I would just post links, you know, say I was on Blogspot, which was, you know, I think Google's first blog. And it was atrocious. The blog that when I look back at it now, I'm like, oh God, what was I doing? I had like a like an image I found on Google search, I guess my logo. And it was just, you know, it was, it was what it was. I was starting out. So I would just tweet and post on Facebook and I started to get a following and it's very small following when I did my first book, but it was enough. I think of people who were really invested in what I was doing and in the story. Um, Self-publishing was just starting to really blow up at that point. Seth Godin was talking about it. It was kind of becoming more normalized. So it was just a really interesting time, I think, to do it. And you self-published your first book, but you looked for publishers to start off with, as you would have I done did. in 2008, nine, yeah. Yeah, I, I really thought that that was the route that I wanted to take. I mean, I was I always had the dream of having the traditional publisher. So I queried a bunch of agents knowing, you know, most most of the time you get rejected. And I actually got a couple of bites. I signed with an agent. We worked on a proposal and I wound up getting rejected 19 different times. Right, even, 19- even with an agent. Even with an agent, I didn't even know there were 19 publishers. I thought yeah. maybe there were five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just faced like all of this rejection. And um, I just was like, I'm not going to let these people make the decision for me and decide whether or not I'm going to be an author. I'm going to figure out a way to do it on my own. And I did. So how did you set about self-publishing? Because this was the Wild West days. I mean, it's, oh, God. It was crazy. Out of it now, but it was in those early <laughs> days. I don't know where, you, where you'd go to find out what to do. So I read an article called uh, Reject the Tyranny of Being Picked and Pick Yourself by Seth Godin. And I think he wrote it in about 2008. Everybody should Google it. It was it was short, but it was just so powerful. And it was around the time. Do you remember Rebecca Black? Mm-hmm. When she was on YouTube. She sang that's on Friday. Friday. Saying, yep. Yeah. I'm, and I'm he big was fan, talking big about fan. <laughs> He was talking about how she, you know, didn't need a pub, uh, uh, record label and, you know, all of the self-published success with all of like, I forgot who was the big um, romance writer at the time. There was somebody that like blew up. Oh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, E.L. James. Yeah. Yeah. E.L. James. And, you know, I just started to kind of look into the industry. And at that time there was, I mean, we weren't even on Instagram. So I was Googling things and I would go on writers forums and start to just collect information. And I had a big like word document that I was just collecting like links for and, you know, trying to figure everything out. It was the days of create space. And I used to call them all day long. I don't know if you remember this, but you could put your phone number in, they'd call you. 
And I would just put my number in all day and ask questions and then write notes and document everything. It was so scrappy, but it worked. And I wound up self-publishing my first book. I had a graphic designer that I met on Facebook. She was a fan of the blog. She did my cover for me. She did the interior and we did it. And that, that all I love about this is, is we talk about self-publishing being, it can remunerate the authors better because of the royalty rates and you know traditional publishing contracts are not great uh, for authors generally, but it's not really that. It's about what your blog was about. It's about empowerment and taking control and making your own decisions, not relying on other people. Self-publishing embodies all of that, doesn't it? Totally. It's about choosing yourself, right? And deciding that you're enough. And I think a lot of people have a hard time with that. And I didn't immediately feel comfortable doing that. I had many, many doubts. You know, I thought like, was everyone going to laugh at me? Am I going to get torn apart on Amazon? Which by the way you do, even if you have a traditional publisher, there are people out there who are going to love you, people who will hate you. But it really is about choosing yourself and just deciding that you're going to make it work and figuring it out. And it is interesting. I never drew that comparison. That really is what my work is about. Um, you know, just yeah. deciding that what you want to do and not waiting around for someone to choose you. And I think so many of us wait for anything, right? We even making the decision to leave my full-time job and write for a living was tough because everyone around me was like, you're crazy. Like you're giving up a six figure job. You have an office in Times Square in New York city, it was biggest media company in the world, basically Viacom. Uh, but I had to just kind of follow that little nudge that was telling me like there was more. Yeah. And I always think my, my friends in America who consider their jobs, uh, one thing we have to take into account in your landscape that we don't have is health cover, which mm -hmm. kind of sounds like a silly thing for, from a European point of view to think about. But I know from friends, they, they run their self-publishing quite a big business. It's still a side hustle because of that health cover. That's when that must have been quite a consideration. It was tough. So at the time I was married and my husband actually wasn't working for a couple of years. So I was carrying the health insurance and I had to wait until he had the job. So then he could cover me under his insurance before I could leave, even though I technically could have All left. Right. Um, and now I'm divorced and thank God I make enough where I can pay for my own insurance. But my health insurance is almost as much as my rent in Manhattan. I mean, yeah. it's absurd what yeah. our our health insurance looks like here. I'm not going to get political, but it's it's it's, it's yeah. a it's a crazy um, <laughs> thing to to from a European point of view to think that is like a handcuff um, to to choosing a slightly different life. But anyway, I thought I'd just mention that. Um, yeah. So this first book, I guess, is was was it called the Champagne Diet? Uh, no, it was called Sparkle, okay. uh, and it was because one of my friends had made a comment to me like, "You got the sparkle back in your eye." Like after I started to write and really just you know move on with my life, so that was it. It was going to be called the Champagne Diaries came sparkle. Um, and that book, actually, I was told like my writing wasn't good enough. I had all the publishers telling me everything like you're not famous, you know, who's going to care basically. <laughs> but um, the book actually hit number one on a couple bestseller lists on Amazon the weekend that it came out. It stayed there for a while. And, you know, it's just it's how many people can you get invested in your story who are going to be excited about it at that time to, to buy it. And fortunately, there were enough people. So that was a big motivator for me. And that was, I think, the moment that I saw like second i can do this on my own i'm not famous you know my book is not groundbreaking but it's about the story you tell and the people you connect with and did the book make money in those early days it made a couple hundred bucks a month i mean it wasn't anything substantial it took time for sure but i think as i started to build on that book um by the time that i got to my third book i was making enough where i could sustain my rent which was the big goal yeah um, but yeah, it took three books and a lot of hustling and a lot of building a community and building my own platform, but I loved it. Yeah. A very you know, typical self-publishing story about the sort of number of books. Um, I'm still yeah. on book one, so I'm still investing, but about to publish book two, which I think will be break even above. Um, okay. So that was book one and based on your blog, thematically, what were you saying? Was it, was it this sort of empowerment message and did you deliberately aim it at women at that stage? So the first book was really about, you know, how I discovered, how I started the blog and really the changes I was going through. So a lot of relationship talk, a lot of talk about choosing happiness, um, developing confidence in myself. I think for a lot of women, especially at the age that I was at, you're confused. You know, you feel like, should I be getting married? Should I be having babies? And my story was very different. I walked away from a relationship that I was in for seven years and he wanted to get married and have babies. And I just knew it was the wrong person. So again, it was a lot of just deciding to really kind of like blaze my own trail when it didn't look like it looked for everyone else on the outside. So I think that struck a chord with women, you know, that they could really just do things in their own way and they didn't really have to follow the status quo. And that was really the theme of that first one. And then it kind of just the second one was the champagne diet. That was more about 
you know, accepting yourself, body positivity, which was kind of a little bit ahead of its time because now that's a big conversation, but this was really something that I, I feel like was on the cusp of, um, which resonated a lot with women. I think we all tend to beat, even men beat ourselves up. We don't feel good enough. Um, that was the second book, which was, I mean, really the champagne diet started because I was looking for a lower calorie drink. So it kind of tied into the blog. Um, and then, I mean, I can get into all of them. There's nine. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go well, into every single we'll, one, but we'll, that was where it began. We'll, we'll talk about them. But, uh, <laughs> I'll be honest, before this interview, I'd never really considered champagne as a, uh, as a choice for a diet, but uh, it makes <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Um, I know that my bit, my drink of choice, which is beer, uh, particularly here in the UK where we don't really do light beer, is terrible. It's the one thing. If I stop doing it, my weight falls away. If I carry on doing it, which I do, um, I find yeah. it more difficult, which is why I go running and cycling just so I can drink beer. But Oh, yeah. Same. I work out to drink champagne. It takes about yeah. um, an hour on the Peloton to burn off, like, you know, I don't know, a bottle of champagne. <laughs> yeah. It's a great <laughs> it's motivator, a isn't it? Oh, totally. Totally. Um, how much of this process was a, a cathartic process for you in helping you deal with those changes in your life and how much of it was doing it because you felt that you needed to help other people? That's a great question. I think it was, it was both for sure. Um, in the beginning it was more cathartic and then I, but I did always remember, I would say like, if I could just help one woman, one person, if one person could read something I wrote and they could feel a little bit less alone because I knew that the books that I, and that I still read to this day, make me feel comforted just to know someone else is going through something, but it was definitely cathartic. Um, I think as I've progressed in my career, I've been more focused on helping others. Like I look at my life and I say, okay, what are the challenges that I've faced? And how can I take that and and tell that story and help somebody else through whatever challenge they're facing? Mm. Where are you? So you, you talked about your other um, books, I think nine of them now. Yeah. And at some yeah. point you did land a traditional deal. When, when did that happen? Yeah. So I left MTV in 2014. And that year I wrote a book called Girl Code. And the book was really about what I was observing in female entrepreneurship, which was a lot of cattiness a lot of competition, a lot of women um, excluding other women from conversations, opportunities. And I just, I had met a couple of women on my journey who were the complete opposite of that. And I was like, I want to be like them. I want to share. I want to be generous with my time, my energy, my whatever, my connections, my wisdom. And the book was really just about how to support other women, you know, and I included stories from other women that I had met that had experienced strong connections with other females. And, and the book took off. I think the first year it sold 50,000 copies on its own just through create wow. space, which was like wild. Yeah. And then, um, at that point, a couple of publishers, literary agents started to reach out to me and penguin random house reached out an editor emailed me one night. It was like the night before Thanksgiving. I'll never forget it. And I was just so excited. I'm like, Oh my God, this is the moment, you know, it's going to happen. And I was very happy self-publishing, but it, of course you have that dream. You have to kind of explore it. And I wound up meeting with her and I signed a double book deal with them, a six figure double book deal. And they bought the rights to Girl Code. And then they signed me for my next book, which is a book called Like She Owns the Place. Um, so I have a lot to say about that whole topic. But I mean, it in a way, it was great because Girl Code was able to be translated in multiple languages and it's in bookstores and airports. And it, it really took off. But it was a tough decision to sell that book because that book was bringing in like 20,000 plus US dollars a month just wow. on my royalties through create space. So it was a lot to give up. Um, but yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. And it was the big one. Penguin Random House is the, the biggest. Huge. So, yeah. And it was portfolio books was the imprint. So Seth Godin, ironically, yeah. was under them. Um, Sophia Amoroso, which did Girl Boss and a, a bunch of other super respectable authors that I loved and admired were on that label. But I say label, like I'm in the music industry, on that imprint. Yeah. Yeah. Stable, they call it, don't they? Yes. Good, good stable <laughs> to be in. Um, okay. So you, uh, you produced the, these books. How how much is there to say? I mean, when do you when you finished a book and you've said, you know, this is what you need to do, this all the po all this positivity stuff, and then you do another book that has a slightly different take on it, or what, where where does it all come from for you? Yeah, so they're all very different. I mean, so the the one I did before Girl, Girl Code was about um, fear, and it was about anxiety and fear and overcoming your fears, and I told a lot of stories through that as well. Um, the latest book that I did, Girl on Fire, actually was about my experience in, self, in traditional publishing and why choosing yourself as an entrepreneur is really the way to go no matter what you're doing. So I feel like I'm able to pull from different experiences. Two of the books that I did are workbooks. So there's a lot of um, 
like storytelling in them, but there's also a lot of space because I am a coach. So there's a lot of space to like answer questions and include prompts. I did a poetry book at one point. So I've kind of explored all of the different arenas. Like I said, I'm writing a memoir now. So I think there's always something to say as long as you're kind of a student of life and willing to look at your life and, and ask tough questions that I think a lot of us don't ask. I definitely have not asked those questions at times, but I notice when I do, I'm able to learn so much and then turn that into something that I can use to help others. Okay. Well, we'll talk about what you do now and coaching and and stuff in a moment, but um, I'm curious as to, and stop me if this gets personal, but where it comes from, you know, what, what was it in your formative life that led you to feel so engaged in wanting to teach, which is basically what you're doing, you're teaching. Yeah. I mean, I think feeling really lost when I was younger and feeling like I didn't really have anyone to ask those questions to or go to. Um, and just feeling like I wish I had had somebody, I never had a mentor, you know, I never had that person that I could really look to. I mean, of course, like I had my mom, I was raised by a single mom. My mom did a great job, but she was busy and she was working and, you know, going to school and working two jobs. And I never really had a person that I could look to. So I almost became like the adult in a lot of ways as a kid. So I think I just naturally took on that role. And I just have always been that person that everybody calls for advice and comes to. And I don't know, I love it. I feel like that's kind of the point of life is to be able to help others. And it also gets you out of your own head. Because if you're sitting around thinking about your problems all day, I mean, it's pretty depressing. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good way of dealing with that. So I'm just wondering whether you were the cat that didn't fit in. Maybe I was. When you wrote that story. Maybe I was. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Maybe. Yeah. I always felt like that as a kid. I always felt insecure. I mean, I think a lot of us do, but I definitely think I created a little world for myself now where I have, you know, this universe of people that I love, you know, and I think I was always sort of like on the outskirts. Like I was like the weird kid in high school. I hung out with the weird kids. I didn't even go to high school. I used to go cut out of school and intern for a record label. Like I was not popular. Like I just kind of did my own thing. So I think now I've created a space for all the weirdos to come yeah. and hang out. And feel it, can, safe. it can be enormously powerful, that sort of uh, experience when you're younger. And um, oh, yeah. I, think, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are driven one way or another through, through not wanting to be like that again or, or, or wanting to have control of their environment. Um, that yeah. certainly seems to be the case with you. Let's talk about what you're doing now. Um, so you, you mentioned coaching, uh, Cara. Is that, what, what's your main, so what, what does your week look like today? So I coach Monday through Wednesday and I have a couple of private clients and I also have a group. So I have a membership club and I have about 400, between four and 500 women in that group. And each month we do two calls. So we do like a masterclass and I pick a topic and it's always related to something, you know, personal development wise. I'm either teaching it myself or I'm bringing in a guest. And then I do like an ask Cara call, kind of like a dear Abby, where people can just come on who are members and like ask me anything they want to ask about business, life, love, So those happen twice a month. So my coaching is really, um, yeah, it's just for private clients. I do courses every now and then, um, do a personal branding course that I roll out like usually twice a year. So I really am just focused, like I said, on helping entrepreneurs, mostly women, really just deal with the stuff that inevitably is going to come up, whether they're an author or, you know, another coach or a jewelry designer, fashion designer, real estate agent, attorney. I work with everybody. Um, I think it's an interesting space to be when you're working for yourself and there's a lot that comes up. So I kind of like to be that person that people can come to and say, how can I get through this situation? I'm struggling. Can you offer me advice? I'm usually a few steps ahead of them. Um, So they're newer entrepreneurs. I've been doing this now for 14 years. So I'm able to take everything I've learned between my entrepreneurship journey and my corporate experience because I, you know, I was in the corporate space for so long as well as a mentor to people. And Let's talk about one or two of the things, the types of things that people come to you with then that you end up dealing because you must have had some repetition over those 14 years, the sort of common things. And I'm thinking particularly self-published authors, uh, perhaps particularly females who who are working at the moment, trying to make a go of it. What sort of areas should, should, do you think would, they would be coming to you and asking about? Um, A lot of people deal with imposter syndrome. They feel like, who am I to write a book? Who am I to start a business? So we do a lot of work around that. Um, a lot of work around the judgment and the fear of what people will think. Mm -hmm. You know, I think especially as an author, I feel like authors are artists, right? We're putting our art into the Mm -hmm. world in whatever format that comes. Um, It's scary to do that. It's your life. You know, it's it's everything that's in your heart. So I I work with them on sort of getting past that fear of like, well, what if I say this? What are people going to say about me? What my parents think, my neighbors think? That's a big theme. 
uh, fear of failure comes up and I don't really believe in failure. I think it's all experience. And if you can reframe it in your own mind, it's less scary because I think we failure is really like what we think someone else is saying about our experience. It's not really what we've gone through. What is a failure at the end of the day? I could call myself a failure, but I would only really be a failure if I stopped and I never self-published and put myself out there. Could have been a failure if I just stopped trying. So I work with a lot of people on that as well. Yeah. And this concept of, of failure is, is critical to understand that you cannot really make progress without it. It's, it's a yeah, fundamental. I mean, look at, right. Look at every successful person out there, whether it's an author or otherwise that we look to, you know, that has quote made it in the world. They've, they have a, like a laundry list of failures under their belts. Everybody has screwed up at some point or made a bad choice or a weird choice and had to kind of realign their path and, and pivot and choose something different. Um, And I think especially, you know, with like the whole pandemic, I feel like we all sort of had to be in that position where we had to rethink a lot of things. And that was a huge lesson in in not really failure, but just kind of um, realignment, if you will. Yeah. So in terms of imposter syndrome, which you're right, is definitely a big issue. Is this um, something that we taught, you know, you can use that concept of of it's not really failure. So if somebody thinks, well, this might be awful and the critic, you know, the critics, the reviewers on Amazon might hate it. Sometimes I, I want to say to somebody, yes, that might be it. But wh- what's next is the big question for you. If 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 the next step is I'm never doing this again, then then you've made it a failure. If the next step is, right, what did I get wrong? What are these common things that people are saying? Let me read a few other books in the same genre. What did they get right? Then your next book solves a lot of that issues and moves you along. Then it's not a failure, is it? It's a, an important stepping stone. Totally. And like, you just, you're never going to please everybody, but I do think it's, it's great what you said. Cause I actually write about that in my last book. Like you should look at the feedback that's coming in. I don't believe in just ignoring it and saying like, I'm so wonderful. I don't have to read this. Like if there's a common thread, um, look at it and decide, is this meaningful to me? Can I take something from this and learn? So for example, when the publishers came to me and said, you know, you don't have a big enough platform. I was like, okay, I'm going to grow a platform. You know, I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to make it work. And you know, I wasn't a celebrity when I put out my book. I'm still not, but I still made it happen. So it's like really looking at it objectively and saying like, what can I learn from this, you know, feedback, if anything, and then just choosing to forge ahead and and figure it out. What do you want to be doing in the future? I mean, are you happy where you are at the moment or do you have ideas of what things are going to look like for you in a couple of years time? Yeah. I mean, I would love to just keep writing. I think I really have been obsessed with writing about relationships and dating and love. That whole topic is so new for me to talk about. So back back to sex in the city. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, I never spoke about it before and there were like reasons why I didn't really speak about it. I was married and I just, you know, I was unhappy. So I felt like who am I to talk about like love? Like it didn't really make sense. But now that I, I got actually got divorced in January of 2020 no idea what was ahead for all of us. I just knew I was, yeah, turning 40 that April. And I was like, I have to move on. This isn't working. And, you know, my husband's a great guy. We're very good friends. It was a very amicable split, but who knew that I was going to get a divorce in the middle of, you know, the beginning of a pandemic. So that's been really interesting dating through the pandemic, finding myself, figuring out like, you know, who I am as this newly single person. So yeah, I want to talk a lot about that. I think um, giving advice to women, I don't really think there's like one right way to give advice about love, but I do think like, helping women really see their worth and realize that like they're okay with or without a relationship. It's been a big conversation that I've been having over like on my podcast and my Instagram stories and, you know, just helping people navigate that and figure out like what is worth staying for, what is not. And I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to the same thing, which is confidence and empowerment and feeling good. And this goes for men too. You know, I think I want to actually expand a little bit and be able to talk to everybody because I've spoken to women for so long, but I have so many readers that reach out and they're like, Oh my God, my husband read your book. You know, my boyfriend listens to your podcast. And I'm like, there's, it doesn't have to just be, you know, centered towards women. So there's some universal stuff there, isn't there? And is that the connection between kind of love and dating and and the more business side of things? The the self-worth is the sort of thing that can solve issues on both sides of that. Yeah. Choosing yourself, no matter what, whether it's for your career as an author or for your relationship or just like your general career, like it does come down to just choosing yourself. And I think being happy where you are, regardless of what's happening around you, right? Regardless of your relationship status, regardless of whether or not you've got a book deal or you're in your business full time, or you're, you've lost those 25 pounds, like being good with who you are, I think is really like, I hate to sound cheesy, but it's like the secret to life, right? Like if you feel good and you're happy, 
the outside things are not going to rattle you as easily. And I think that's what I really want to kind of drive home to people. Yeah, there's definitely a, a secret to enjoying the moment and enjoying who you are, and what you're doing. And I don't think that many of us have it. I don't, to be honest. I mean, I work hard. I'm, I think I'm a bit better now than I was. But I spend most of my life thinking at some point I'll be doing something that makes me happy. Or, yeah. you know, you go on holiday and you can just enjoy it rather than feeling worried about all the other things going on. And it's just, it's just it's stupid, really, because whatever job I've had, none of them have really required me to sweat my way through a holiday. It was a choice I made. And I didn't realize I was making that choice. Yeah. And like, that's my biggest lesson at the moment is just being here now and enjoying the present and not thinking too far ahead. Because, if, you know, I didn't know 14 years ago, I'd, I couldn't have predicted where I'd be now. So I hope I can't predict the future because exciting stuff happens. Like you want to have somewhat of a vision and be working towards goals. But I think the best stuff really happens when you don't have the plan, when you just sort of like, you know, my friend has this expression. She's like, you just have to have open palms. And that's just been in my head. Like, oh, if you think of your palms being open, you just like imagine things kind of landing and happening for you. It doesn't mean you don't work hard and you don't pursue things, but just allowing life to surprise you is probably like the biggest thing that I'm trying to do right now. Yeah. And this this idea about choosing yourself and believing in yourself and making choices for yourself, that's not to be confused with not being altruistic, right? And not doing good things for other people that you know, potentially cost you time and money. Because I sometimes yeah. sort of think people think it's a selfish thing to choose yourself, but that's not really what you're talking about, is it? Yeah, and I think we need to redefine selfish, right? Like that's like a whole other conversation. Like being selfish isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't mean that you're rejecting people around you. You're isolating yourself. You're, you're, it, I think it's about the intention. If your intention is to be happy, the happier you are, the better you're going to be for the people around you, the better you're going to be for your partner, your parents, your friends, your clients, your friend, family, whoever. Um, I think we tend to think, you know, we should be selfless and we should put other people before us. And unless it's your kids, which of course should always be a priority. I think I don't have kids, but I respect anyone who does. And I think that obviously has to be a priority. But other than that, it's like, you've got to be happy. You've got to do things for yourself. And I think this world would be such a better place if we were all doing a little bit more for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So let's turn it back uh, before we wrap up to um, publishing, which is where we started. The self-published versus trad published. You're in quite a good position now to explore both of those. What's mm -hmm. your, I mean, you said, you know, getting that deal was a big moment for you, but What's your takeaway on those two? And what would you advise people? Self-publishing all the way. I mean, there's so many reasons. I think number one, financially, you're in such a better position if you can self-publish. Because even if the first book doesn't, you know, make it right off the bat, like you still can build on that. You own the lion's share of the royalties. You own your creative rights, which is huge. Um, you also have like the creative control and the timeline. You know, you can write a book in a month if you really wanted to. When you're traditionally publishing, it's usually about 18 months from start to finish until that book hits the shelves. And I know when I did my book with Penguin, I was over it. By the time it came out, I didn't want to look at it, didn't want to talk about it. I was on to the next idea. Um, I think also just having like, again, the control, you know, you're dealing with people. I, I was assigned. And again, I don't want to like, you know, trash talk Penguin. They were great. I'm very grateful for the experience, but I was assigned a very junior publicist who didn't have experience. And when I asked about it later, you know, they said she'd wanted to work with me, but I really didn't get a say in that. I got more press on my own organically than I did through them. So I just, I don't know. I feel like it's just the way of the future. I hate to sound again, corny, like <laughs> it's true. Um, they're an antiquated model. They're really not looking to um, evolve. And I think when you're self-publishing, there are so many changes and there's so many things, as long as you're willing to put in the work and treat your book like a business. And that is one thing I will always tell people, you have to treat your book like a business. You have to look at that and say, this is my baby and I'm in control of it. And I've got to stay up to date on what's going on. If you're willing to do that, then I think self-publishing is for sure the way to go. Your clients you work with, do you have many writers? I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I actually do a self-publishing course. So we've got people that come into that. We release it once a year and it's just been incredible. And I think it's, it's a mix of people who are entrepreneurs who want to establish more credibility in what they're doing or people who just want to tell their story, who are happy with their, you know, their work and their full-time job. And they just have a story to tell and they want to share it with the world. So I work with a lot of writers and it's fun because, you know, you see people who otherwise may, may not have ever thought they could be an author. And now all of a sudden they're holding their book in their hands and there's no feeling like that. I mean, I remember the first time, I, I'm sure you know this feeling very well, like you held that book and you're like, I did this. Yeah, It's something that most people dream of, but to actually do it. And it's so much more accessible than people realize. Yeah. 
Yeah, I often think I think it's an achievement in its own right. And I don't think until you've written and published a novel, you realise how much of an achievement it is. It's a it's a sweat. Um, and that's oh, it's what, a labour of love. That's how I deal with imposter syndrome to an extent when I get a bad review. And I'm thankfully I've had you know good reviews of my book, but some people just lay into you and say this is rubbish and tawdry or whatever. And you just think, where's your novel? Exactly. Where's your novel? You're right. The only place those people are published is a comment box on Amazon. Yeah, nice line. They're not in a book. <laughs> I don't comment on it, of course, but that's what I should say. Um, okay, Cara, thank you. It's been brilliant talking to you. I feel quite uh, motivated. I know I'm not necessarily a target audience, but like you say, the universal nature of what you're talking about actually goes across genders anyway. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you in London. I don't, this interview probably will go out after the conference, but from where I'm sitting here, looking forward to seeing you in London and we'll, um, we'll have a chat. And I'll, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will be checking out your books now. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It was great to talk to you. And don't forget that cat, by the way, because I think at some point we do need to see that book. I might bring it. I'll bring it to London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Carl. Thank you. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Really love talking to Kara. I uh, felt very motivated after that. She's a very motivating uh, person and her books, um, I'm sure, are the ones that are going to unleash some talent around the world good mark so just to mention uh the as authors will be open in five days time uh well if you're watching this on uh, on the day it's released but august the 10th for three weeks max and all you need to do is go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash ads for authors and you can read all about it you can read everything that's in the course there's a very detailed set of pages there to describe for you everything that's in there there's even a little chat box on the bottom right hand corner and sometimes it's mark and me answering those chats more often it's john or catherine and the team and they will be honest with you about whether it's going to be a good investment for you or not at this stage and we are still continuing because covid won't go away with a two-year payment plan to make it as easy as possible uh, and make the entry as easy as possible for people to learn about driving your sales with paid ads. That, Mark Dawson, is that. Thank you, so, Brett. You're welcome. I hope I'm not, I just started sniffing. I hope I'm, because my house is full of COVID at the moment. <laughs> I do not want COVID because I'm about to get on a flight no. to America on holiday. I thought I do get a bit snuffly, as you know, from alcohol. I haven't drunk for two days. We drank every day, <laughs> didn't we, in London last week? So I've tried to ease off it. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. All right. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, that nasty virus. Okay, thanks very much uh, indeed uh, to everybody behind the scenes for putting these uh, together over the summer in particular. Uh, very much appreciated. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show.